Hello and welcome to Steeple Playhouse. Of course, formerly the uh, very historic First Baptist Church, and my name is Eric Paradise. I'm the community liaison for your theater and Steeple Playhouse. Uh, I would like to thank the mayor and his staff, city officials, state representatives, city representatives, member of Waterfront Historic Area League, First Baptist Church, and your theater, and members of the press and the community for coming to this very exciting day. We have a number of wonderful people who will want to speak to you today, so I'd like to jump right in and begin with our favorite neighbor to the east, Mayor John Mitchell. All right. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. This is, uh, so some of you have already heard this excuse. I don't, have a, I don't have a tie on today. I thought we were going to be outside. Uh, and so it gets worse. Uh, it gets worse. So I'll just let's just. In the, in the sake of transparency, this is, this is what I have on today. Uh, right? It's not just that I didn't dress up, I, I decidedly dressed down. So, but never mind me, let's talk about the occasion. Um, uh, it's an occasion that is um, some at least 11 years, arguably 11 years, arguably much longer than that in, in coming. Um, I think we're all familiar with the historical significance of this place, right? So this uh, 1829 structure, which is coming up on its 200th anniversary, has played uh, a, I would argue, a, a seminal role in the city's history, but also a significant role in world history, uh, in the workings of of democratic governance around the, uh, the world. And so, but, but it's worth, retelling at least uh, in a bridge form. So the First Baptist Church is, is the only church remaining uh, in the city that was depicted in the original city seal. So if you look at the city seal of New Bedford with the logo Lucium de Fundo, the we spread the light, um, there are steeples depicted and this is, this is the only one that is left. So for that reason alone, it's important to, it was important to preserve. Um, but it's more significant. This was, a, this was a church that supported the abolitionist movement, which was, uh, for which there was a cauldron of activity here in New Bedford. New Bedford uh, was in, uh, it was Leah Catherine Glover, right, who said New Bedford at the time was uh, freedom's Gibraltar, right? We had, uh, according to her, an esteemed historian writing for the National Park Service, that at the time New Bedford had the highest per capita number of uh, fugitive slaves, uh, of, of freed slaves, uh, of any, anywhere in the north, right? So, and this was this along certainly with uh, the Unitarian Church were two places where abolitionism uh, fomented. Uh, it was a very significant part of uh, not only what New Bedford was doing at the time, but the, uh, but, uh, the nation uh, was, uh, was working on it um, for reasons we're all familiar with. Um, but fast forward through the Civil War, this church had another very, very significant chapter. Um, so for anybody who's um, watched the public hearing and watched it go awry and watched it be brought back into, into some level of order, we have one person uh, to thank from that time, and that's Captain Roberts, who's the garrison commander at, uh, down at the fort at, at the time, right? This is... Uh, years, a few years after the Civil War, and at the time he came here to uh, participate in a, in a public meeting, there was a rabble of sorts, and, uh, and he, I guess, was all about order, and he said, well, we, we, need to, we need to fix this. And so he penned something that became known to the world in, in his name as Robert's Rules of Order, which as we know, governs parliamentary process the world, the democratic world over, uh, and in that way, uh, this is this this place had a, a major, decisive, not decisive, but but decided role in um, the way that we govern ourselves uh, across the world. And so we haven't heralded that fact enough. There's, it is a big deal. It's a really big deal. It's a huge deal. Um, and so. You know, we'll continue to think about how we, as time goes on, 
uh, how we proclaim that as a really significant part of New Bedford's history and something that New Bedford gave to the world. But in, in the meantime, we have had to figure out how to preserve this place. Um, I don't know if Jack Spillane is here. So Jack Spillane, as I think a lot of folks know, and he probably will you know, cringe when I say that he's a neighbor of this place. He is a neighbor. He's written about the need to preserve this place for a long time and for many, many years. And when I first got into office, I think he turned me on to the idea of just how important it was to preserve uh, the First Baptist Church. Um, and it was hard. Uh, it was hard to do. You know, Reverend Said was the leader of the flock at the time, and I think you guys were down to about 25 congregants at, uh, then, which was uh, really tough to hang in there and fund preservation uh, efforts. Um, and, you know, I really uh, I'll hasten to add that uh, the Reverend was really instrumental in kicking off what ultimately became the, pre the preservation effort in earnest. Um, but it was, I think things really kicked into gear in 2012, and it was a dark and stormy night when it happened. There was a great deal of damage that was done to the church, which was ostensibly falling apart, but in particular it was the steeple. So as somebody who has a reserved parking space uh, right there, I was keenly aware of so the risk that a uh, disintegrating steeple right next door would pose uh, to my own automobile and um, we talked Dan Loros here the city's historic planner and Christina Connolly the chief operating officer for the city we sort of sat down and said okay we gotta the church doesn't have the money to do anything about this and we got if that steeple falls down the rest of the place is gonna go we've got to do something and so the, the something was in consultation with the city's um, legal staff was that we could you find some money to do it, go do an emergency repair and avoid procurement issues and, and such like giving public money to a private entity like that right would run a could run a file of state procurement law we figured we could do it in good faith and figure out a you know a legal justification for it and that justification was to proceed on an emergency basis so we spent about sixty thousand dollars more or less to shore that up and prevent it from toppling over onto my car, or Christina's car, um, <laughs> and so that there, there but that that sparked the conversation. And I just, it's just it's look at this, it's, you know, 11 years later, uh, it's taken a it's taken a while, and there's a lot of folks here who were there then. But you know, I really want to thank Ann Laura for her efforts and and helping uh, facilitate the conversation the reverend for the work that was done. Um, we needed a user, and then uh, there came uh, your theater, which is such a terrific institution in the city, a local theater troupe that goes all the way back to the, to the 1940s. And so for people like Eric and, and Al and so many others of you who are here, Ray, um, we started to have that conversation to figure out how do you, how do you build, put the financing package together, how do you how do you proceed? The work of Whale, of course, Diane Henry, the Whale uh, Board, then later D Terry Bernard, all those folks uh, played a big role uh, in getting to a point where this place could satisfy the needs of the congregation, could be activated in a way that generated revenue, and uh, preserve the building. And so we're, here we are. I, I, I got to tell you, this for me, for my administration, uh, this was the single most important historic preservation project, hands down, in the city. Uh, we've done a lot of historic preservation work. This was the most, most important thing. This was in uh, the most dire straits, and uh, I'm just very proud that we can stand here today and look around and say, it happened. So uh, there are a lot of people to thank uh, in this effort. Funding came from a number of sources, city, state, federal, private, other, uh, and a whole lot of expertise from, from Whale. I want to thank uh, the city team, again, Christina and Ann uh, in particular, but, but also the, the, uh, the funds that we were able to come up with from the, uh, the Community Preservation Act, which we passed just through the work of Lee and so many others uh, just a few years later freed up a whole lot of cash to do precisely this is kind of what we had in mind right uh, and so that that happened um, the support from the federal level congressman keating has been 
a huge proponent of community, the community preservation block grant program, the CDBG funds that have gone in. Uh, he is a big supporter of the ARPA um, bill, the American, uh, Re American Rescue Plan Act, which passed a couple of years ago, which uh, I think we have about 200, about a quarter of a million dollars in ARPA funds uh, in their bill, and I think that's, that has helped the, the, the financing stack uh, as, as well. And uh, state funds, uh, Chris and, and Tony, big supporters of the uh, Cultural Facilities Fund uh, as, as, as well. I mean, all these things are folded into, uh, into the financing to make this happen, $3 million in particular. Uh, so I want to thank you guys for all that support. I say all this, and I, and I say all this, and I hasten to add, I will leave people out in the accolades and the, and the thanks, because there's a lot of it, an awful lot of it to, to go around. Bristol County Savings Bank, Michelle, um, so many, and I, and I regret that I can't like, cover it all, but I, it's a way of underscoring that these big projects, and this is a historic pro preservation gets really complicated really fast, right? There also is a whole set of regulatory um, hurdles that you have to go through to make things look just so, to if you're gonna get money to do what you want to do. And money doesn't appear out of thin air. There's a lot of need out there. And sometimes when we make choices to preserve something, it comes at the expense of other things that we'd like to be doing in the city. There is, to an extent, a zero-sum game when we make these policy choices. but. Preserving the past uh, is so important uh, because uh, no city can thrive if it doesn't have a, a sense of collective identity, right? This connects us to a past uh, in our city that we can all cherish, uh, a past that speaks to our values, right? A place where uh, it was significant on the world stage but also meant some, means something even today about, uh, about equality and liberty, and that's pretty cool. And so there's no way we could not, we, we as a city, as a functioning city, could allow this thing to continue to, to deteriorate. So I am thrilled at all the work that went into this. There are lots of people uh, who deserve credit for it. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, Catherine Duff, I have to hasten to add to, uh, who provided her expertise as well along the way. Um, if you were just sitting in front of me, Catherine, it could have, I would have forgotten, waited to the end to cite your work, but it was instrumental, and we'll hear from you in a second. But I, I just want to say great job. Everybody, great job. It's easy for an elected official to get up, um, despite our direct efforts and all this, just get up here and say, hey, you know, uh, isn't this wonderful? But it's wonderful because of the work that you guys did, and uh, I can't wait to see plays in here and see what this contributes to, the, to our downtown art scene, but also, more importantly, what it will continue to mean for future generations of New Bedford residents who are looking for inspiration. Thank you, everybody. And now, uh, thankfully, uh, Congress went into recess just in time for U.S. Rep. Bill Keating to come and join us. Representative. Thank you, Eric uh, and uh, Mayor Mitchell. When you're coming here talking about uh, kicking off something like this more formally, you can dress any way you want. <laughs> uh, no one will mind at all. In fact, I think I'm you're smart right now. you're probably more appropriately dressed than uh, I am. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with uh, two of my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, Chris and Tony, are terrific uh, proponents for the New Bedford community. Uh, and are always there. I, I love collaborating with them at the state level as I do with the mayor at, at the local level. Uh, you know, my wife, Tevis, is here. It's her, uh, it's her birthday. I almost said which year. It's her birthday uh, today, and we were talking about where we could, you know, go during the course of the day, and I told her, you know, why don't you come along with me with this if you'd like, and she was so excited. We have this discussion in our home quite a bit. She will say, I really miss the things of the the past. I really wish I could go back sometimes, and I remind her, well, you can't. So we have to go looking to the future. But this is an example of, and I remind her of the movie, Back to the Future. I said, think of it Back to the Future. We can preserve some of those things and bring it forward. And, and uh, this is a great example of Back to the Future. Uh, it's got all the ingredients, and, and the city of New Bedford is so lucky uh, that it has such a historical past. 
but it's also fortunate that it's preserved so much of it, uh, and it's utilizing it to create a great modern city uh, and a great example uh, of that kind of transference that's there. Uh, the beautiful uh, seascape that you have out there, looking out in the horizon uh, over the harbor, uh, the historical buildings at a point in our history where uh, this was one of the richest, if not the richest community in the United States. Uh, probably wasn't fully the United States at that time. But you look around at the buildings that are here that were the banks and financial institutions and see what's there. And it, and it makes this city so special. But taking it from the back to the future is not always easy. And this city has done a remarkable job in so many levels of taking state assistance, having local priorities, incorporating the private side in this. And you could look from, as a federal partner, I will tell you, uh, whether it's look at the health care and how that's been utilized, the federal resources that are here so carefully, look at the, some of the educational things that's used, look at the infrastructure, some of it not as dramatic as this, whether it's wastewater or whether it's uh, Brownsfield cleanup, but those things are important too to bring us all forward. And, and look at what's happening with modern wind and, and what's the, the future continues here. Uh, but leveraging that money, uh, not wasting it, putting it where it's partnered with other resources makes, it, makes days like today possible. And this is a great example, the private sector, 10 years, uh, to sustain an effort for over 10 years as the people that originally moved this forward is extraordinary when everything today is moving at such a fast pace and to s sustain that was so critical. I wanna thank those people that in the beginning had the idea and the initiative and saw it through. Uh, so back to the future, uh, here in particular, look at the history that's here. Uh, it's a history in our early culture where communities, the, the, the pivotal part of a community were places of worship uh, and the spiritual communities. Actually, if you look at New England, that's what brought communities together. Then they had public safety issues and other things to think of, but it was that central theme. Uh, and look at the history here uh, where those spiritual issues always would encompass social issues, important social issues of the time, as the mayor mentioned, in terms of the abolition and other factors, where people came together uh, in a place. So I always look at the analogy of uh, a house and a home. Uh, you can go into a house uh, and, and just look at it. Uh, our daughter's in real estate, so we'll go through houses or look at houses. And, and you can look at it a certain way, how many windows are there, what are the floors like? But it's a house. But when you go into your home, you have a different feeling. Uh, you have a feeling because it is, you're comfortable, but you have a feeling because the belongings in that home, you or another member of that home picked out. It has individualist meaning to it. It gives you comfort and it makes it part uh, of something that is totally different than a house. You can have the same thing between having a city and a community. Uh, every city has a charter, uh, they take taxes, they do everything. But are they truly communities? And, and what makes the difference between a city and a community? And I, th I would give you, this is exhibit A. This is what makes it different. Preserving the past, being sensitive to that, knowing it has value, but then giving it new meaning. A and when you're dealing with a with the difference between a city and a community, one of the things I always look to is the arts and the culture because that's what makes it different, the same way a house is different than a home. It's that arts and culture, the intrinsic difference in values that are there. And, and this community uh, is, is a great example of that. This project is one of the greatest examples of that because you're taking the arts and culture here. Uh, I'm sure, hey, it's a Baptist. Uh, there was a lot of singing that went along here in the early days. Uh, and now the, the jazz festival was here. Uh, singing is coming back here. Uh, not just singing, but cultural-oriented arts and, 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 and performances will be done here. Preservation, but sharing it with a new generation into the future. So uh, I'm so excited about these kind of, uh, uh, of endeavors 
uh, and, and to see what happened uh, and to be part of the finishing part and the, the hard work's already done over 10 years to get here. And I'm so pleased that the federal resources in part that we provide uh, are so uh, intelligently and sensitively used to make indeed this city a community. So congratulations on, uh, on a terrific day here. Thank you. We're also pleased to welcome Representative Cabral to the stage. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, this is an exciting day. You know, I'm not going to go through all the historical um, aspects that they may have talked about, but it is. Let's stop in a little bit, a few seconds in time, and just contemplate uh, what we have done here. We have saved uh, uh, not only a building, but saved an historical place in New Bedford. As the mayor mentioned, it's depicting the city seal, and I believe it's also depicting the panorama uh, over at the um, William Museum as well. Uh, I remember clearly over 10 years ago, about 11 or so, when the steeple was going to fall off. You know, I remember that. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and so the very first action that we took, and you know, I think uh, before I go on, I think we got to give uh, credit where it's due, and, and that's Whale. Okay, Whale is the organization that really made it happen. Whale is the organization that came to the rescue, if you will, of the congregation that will be still here on the other side, um, and became the guiding light to, uh, to really make this project a reality going forward. And working with Whale at that time, we were able to secure the very first grant for this project. It was $100,000 from the state, and the idea was to save, this, of course, the steeple, and, and then in order to, if we don't save that, then how, how are we going to really preserve this building you know, uh, and make it uh, in a way that we can use it today, which is the case. You know, your theater is fantastic. This is a great home for them. Uh, I'm sure they are very excited as we are here in the city. Uh, but when you think about it, when you preserve places like this, such as this one, this is really part of the DNA of this community. This is really was there, the founding of the city, right? This building was there. Not to mention uh, the Robert Rules of Water and everything else that uh, was crafted here or because of uh, what was happening here at the time. So when you want to look at a society or a city or a community, uh, you've got to look at how they take care of, of their, their uh, buildings and facilities and institutions that really make part of that, the DNA of that founding of that city. And this is what we have done here. Uh, I think Whale has done a, a fantastic job. As the mayor said, local money, state money, federal money, uh, private money. Uh, and it's usually how projects like this can get done. Uh, it's not one funding sort, source. So the ability uh, uh, to really put all those funding sources together and, uh, and keep at it, you know, 11 years, you got to have tenacity, right? <laughs> you really do. Uh, so um, this is fantastic. I'm delighted. I was a, a little small part of it. Uh, as my service to the people of New Bedford, uh, making sure that the state was a partner in this as well. And I don't know who chose the color, but it's, it's about the same shade of gray as my living room. So I kind of like it. <laughs> and the white trimming, which I have a lot of white trim in my living room. So this is a great choice of colors. <laughs> So uh, thank you again to Whale and to everybody else and all the other partners. And uh, thank you to the mayor and the city and, of course, uh, Congressman Keating uh, for the federal participation and partnership. Um, we have more work to do in New Bedford around the issues of this nature. So let's stay tuned and uh, we'll look for your partnership. Thank you. Glad you feel at home here, Representative Cabral. That's good. Uh, and we have another representative, Representative Hendricks. Please.
Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, just want to thank everybody uh, and congratulate everyone who was a part in, in making this happen. I grew up in the West End of New Bedford, so I, I'm very familiar with this building and, and its condition over the years. I also, you know, was a, a fan of, and to this day, still a fan of your theater. My cousin was an actor in that, in that program some years ago. So this is a real special day to be celebrating this uh, with you all. Um, it's also another, as, as was said, is a great example of federal, state, and, and local uh, collaboration and partnership coming together to, to do something that's going to have a lasting effect. Um, so I'm really happy uh, for everyone here. The congressman mentioned several times, I must say, uh, the movie Back to the Future, which he doesn't know this, but that's my favorite movie of all time. I, I could literally sit here before you and tell you every single line in order. If you, if you want, I can. Um, but, but uh, with that, I'll close with a, a line from Doc Brown who said, the future is what you make of it, so make it a good one. Um, and so everyone in this room is going to make the, new, uh, new, the city of New Bedford brighter and better because of what they've done here today. Thank you. The flux capacitor is actually just below me. Uh, and uh, so I'd, I'd the pleasure to introduce the president of the Your Theatre Board, who I've worked very closely with, uh, as many other volunteers at Your Theatre, uh, Sue Richard. Thank you, Eric. You know, it's a little intimidating coming up here after these wonderful speakers, but I'm happy to speak for your theater. I've been president of the board for I don't know how many years. I keep saying that as soon as we finish the project, that's when I'm going to leave the board. I don't know if it's going to happen, but it just might. I'm here to basically thank so many people for everything that they've done for your theater. First of all, to Reverend Saeed and his congregation for trusting that this project was the right one, that this was the right way to go. To all of our contributors, everybody who's donated any kind of, of funds, whether it's small or large, because obviously without them, this could never happen. To all our volunteers, there have been so many people who have worked so hard over the last 10 years to make all of this happen. And specifically in the theater, we have some people who have spent more time here at the steeple than at their real jobs. We have people like Larry Hubre, for example, and Eric Paradise, uh, Bill Spinney, who works for us but has put in so many more hours as a volunteer, uh, to Al Vitale and Gil Cardona Arazzo and Michelle Dumary and so many others. We want to thank them all so much because without them, of course, none of this could have happened. We want to thank Whale and their board, everyone in the office, everyone who made it possible. We never could have done it without them. And they've been so easy to work with. It's been a wonderful, wonderful cooperative uh, opportunity for us. To the city of New Bedford and to Mayor Mitchell and the various state agencies who have supported and helped us through all of this project, uh, long as it has been. And we've created a beautiful addition to the city of New Bedford and to the downtown area. And finally, to our founder, Mary Smith, and to two people who dedicated most of their lives to your theater, Ed McGuire and Cindy Messier. They would be so proud to be standing here today and having this opportunity to dedicate this beautiful building. It was their dream to have a home for your theater. Their hard work and dedication made it all possible. Once again, thank you to everyone who has made this day a reality. Thanks. And I think the organization of the hour, uh, representative and new executive director from Whale, Erin Miranda. Good morning. Um, it is truly an honor to represent Whale on this very exciting and memorable day. A day that some of us felt like would never arrive, but it did, and we're here celebrating a new chapter for the First Baptist Church and the Steeple Playhouse, and a new and exciting opportunity 
for the performing arts and historic preservation here in New Bedford. For over 60 years, Wales' work has focused on some of the most important and threatened historic buildings in New Bedford. And since 2014, this project has really embodied our mission. But what really drives our mission is people. We do our work so that people can use, experience, enjoy, and thrive in the historic buildings that we preserve, restore, and revitalize. And on November 18th, members of the Whale Board of Directors and staff were privileged to attend one of the first performances of Murder on the Orient Express. The building was full of life. It was full of people. It was bustling, from attendees lined up for concessions to cast and crew getting ready for curtains up. The excitement and the energy was palpable. To be in this historic space as it was creatively envisioned so many years ago was really, really inspiring. Though my tenure with Whale has spans only a few months, the dedication and commitment that has been put into the restoration of this building by the project team has been evident since day one. Well, technically my second day was my first project meeting here, but it's close enough. <laughs> Many thanks to our architect, Catherine Duff of Studio to Sustain, our general contractor, Joe Machado with A Plus Construction, and every single person from tradespeople to volunteers, local advocates and advisors, there are too many to name, but thank you for all you've done for this project. Thank you to Reverend Said and the First Baptist Congregation for the confidence that you put in us to preserve this iconic building, and uh, to preserve this iconic building, its history, and give it a chance to continue telling its important story. A huge thank you to Mayor Mitchell and your administration for identifying First Baptist as a priority so many years ago. Thank you for your partnership and support, especially with critical funds for this project, from CDBG grants to ARPA funds. Thank you very much to all of our state and federal partners. Thank you to the Community Preservation Committee for many rounds of funding, as well as the Massachusetts Historical Commission for grants and historic tax credits. We'd also like to recognize the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the 1772 Foundation, the Amelia Peabody Foundation, Bristol County Savings Bank, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and so many others. And thank you to everybody who donated, large and small, who volunteered, who offered much needed words of encouragement along the way, and truly believed in this endeavor. We'd also like to recognize the contributions of the National Association of Parliamentarians and the Roberts Rules of Order Association, who are extremely delighted that the birthplace of those rules of order is now preserved. Many thanks to the Board of Directors of Whale for your perseverance, your expertise, and your dedication to the historic resources of this city. And thanks to Whale's amazing staff, past and present, who have all had a hand in this project, especially our general manager, Diane Broder, who unfortunately does not work on Fridays, so she's not here. <laughs> she's babysitting her two grandsons. And of course, to Terry Bernert, my predecessor, who worked for 10 years to bring this project from vision to reality, we offer sincere thanks this morning. And finally, thanks to our partner throughout this journey, your theater. May this new chapter for the building be a new chapter for you as you settle into your new home. I do miss the weekly site meetings, but we are all excited to see the great things that will come from the Steeple Playhouse. Thank you very much. Miss the site meetings. I guess, I guess so. I guess we miss them. They, I mean, you know, just having to do them was the problem, but they were fun. Yeah, it was. It was nice. Um, I, I really want to give a special welcome to Catherine Duff from Studio to, to Sustain for, uh, for her, all of her efforts, and uh, we, we'd like to hear from her from her perspective as, as an architect, on, uh, the lead architect on the project. Wow, um, what an honor to be here today. I'm going to be a little bit of a geek and talk about the building, as I think you've gotten an extraordinary history of the heritage of this building in the city. So thank you, Aaron and Whale, and thank you to your theater, the group that courageously took on this project, and you patiently worked through many challenges to be here today. This work is hard, and you have my utmost respect. Eric, Larry, Bill, Sue, 
and the whole crew. The most sustainable building is the one that already exists. Saving First Baptist Church and transforming the sanctuary into a community theater preserves the building and a heritage while activating a community space. Combined with energy efficiency, improvements made, the Steeple Playhouse is a model of sustainability. Community, ecology, economy, and history. Restoration and preservation. Studio to Sustain was late to the party. We were engaged on the eve of construction to assist Whale and your theater in the construction phase of this project. And like many community development projects, we had our challenges. We had a challenging building, a challenging site, a very challenging budget, and a very challenging program. We orchestrate a collaborative problem-solving approach with the whole team. Everybody's at the table. There's a role for everyone. The owners, Whale and Your Theater, the contractors, A Plus, and Joe's whole team, the City of New Bedford Inspectional Services, the Department of Public Infrastructure, the New Bedford Fire Department, really critical in this project, Massachusetts Historic Commission, and all the funders who stepped up these past years. One giant team and one same dream. I want to invite everyone here today to participate in a fun scavenger hunt over the coming years as you visit Steeple Playhouse for many performances and events. I invite you to experience the parts of the building you don't actually see right now, the stuff that isn't sexy, but is imperative to the project, and frankly, the building. At S2S, we see challenges as opportunities. We began with a structural review of this building, and we quickly realized that the historic structure could not support the proposed HVAC system in the attic, the beautiful plaster ceiling that was falling down, the lighting structure that you see installed here, and the elevator in the rear of the building. Hence, a redesign of the bones of the building commenced. Moving the HVAC system into the sanctuary enabled us to save and restore the historic attic structure and the plaster ceiling. We increased efficiency and decreased maintenance of this system a very important aspect for nonprofit owners moving forward, as your theater will quickly discover. But hiding these in an historic performance sanctuary? That was a trick. Where did we hide two very large, often noisy, air handlers? I want to see if you can find them. And I'm going to give you a hint. They are not behind the black curtain behind me. And these exquisite exterior walls of this sublime sanctuary with historic single pane glass. Great for a day like today, but challenging for the theatrical performances. While preserving these walls, we identified a void that we filled with blown in insulation. And remember the historic attic that would not support the HVAC system? That space became a vessel for blown insulation. Continuing our thermal envelope and the dirt crawl space below me, two stories, not one, because there's another theater space below us. We covered that dirt floor with the vapor barrier and dehumidification, completing that thermal wrap for the building. These improvements increase air quality, preserve structures, increase efficiencies and resilience, preparing Steeple Playhouse for her next 200 years. The site received a facelift as well, with added accessibility, rain gardens, subsurface storm chambers, and dry wells, beautifying the site, creating safe access, and meeting the very strict Massachusetts stormwater mitigation regulations. And the windows. How to preserve an historic large single glazed window with interior historic shutters and make this energy efficient and able to be blacked out for theatrical performances. We quickly discovered that no product existed, so we designed a solution and found a fabricator. 
Some prototypes failed. Ultimately, Allied Windows fabricated a solution that preserves the historic window and transforms the sanctuary into a theater. These are currently being fabricated and will be installed in 2024. This collaborative, creative, and visionary project has been an honor. I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know your theater and respect Whale for their perseverance. I am indebted to the municipal and state leaders present today for their leadership and for their support. And I extend appreciation to Governor Healy and her administration. Massachusetts has one of the most progressive building codes in the nation. These projects are very challenging, especially in light of this. But the state leadership inspires us to all be better, and we welcome their aspirational goals, and we thank them. So cheers, take great pleasure, and thanks. This was a lot of fun. Okay, one more speaker, and then we're going to make smaller ribbons out of a big ribbon. Um, your theater has been excited and honored to be part of this project. We are a humble 77-year-old volunteer organization with one part-time business manager who works more than that, and we would have not gotten involved with this project, an incredibly important project, an historic building if it were not for the expertise and abilities of Whale. From the 10 years of service from Terry Burnett and many years of work from A Plus Construction to the foresight of the First Baptist Church, recognizing the building's importance and continued life, to the fastidious commitment of the Whale Board, all the way to the energetic and thorough leadership that Aaron Miranda now brings to Whale. This has been an incredible experience. We're grateful for the assistance received from our neighbors, Gallery X and the Zyterian, and to all the groups that, have, that I have spoken with that are eager to use the space as a performing arts space. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the many YTI volunteers that I stood shoulder to shoulder to or Zoom to Zoom with in countless meetings, site visits, planning sessions, all for the good of the organization and done in their free time. This has been a learning experience for sure. And we are still not done, frankly, f with your theater. This is just the beginning. The process was never easy, never simple. But great things do not come easy. And this project is a textbook example of this. When the challenges arose, no one was more prepared or capable of solving them than Catherine Duff from Studio to, to, to Sustain. We were constantly comforted by her experience and ability and um, on a personal note, one doesn't normally talk of an architect as having a good bedside manner. But in my case, uh, she often was able to keep the patient calm and educated about the process and kept things moving forward. So thank you. Repurposing this building into an act active performing arts conference, event, and wedding space will not only preserve the building for generations to come through being fully activated, but will provide a much needed small to mid-sized performance space in the heart of downtown with a transformable stage, professional lighting and sound array, updated accessibility and utilities. This will primarily be the home of your theater, as you know, but we have already begun discussions with many area groups that are interested in renting the space as a performance facility and gathering space. What, a, what better way to honor its roots than by being a place where community can gather? Steeple Playhouse can be likened to a three-shift plant of creativity, and we manufacture art, memories, and experiences. Your theater fills one of these shifts with its annual season, and now we have expanded opportunities for improv, cabaret, theater for and by children, education in the theater arts for all ages, and potential for movie house and other simulcast offerings, and more. We are working hard now to fill those other two shifts with worthy offerings that will not only keep the building standing for the next 200 years, but provide a reasonably priced space for nonprofits, private groups, and individuals to gather, celebrate, and inspire. 
In fact, we have a traveling production tonight. <laughs> one night only. Uh, an award-winning one-actor interpretation of The Christmas Carol. Tickets still available. Uh, and in January, we continue the Your Theater season with A Doll's House Part Two, a modern take on a sequel of the classic play. So having two distinct theater spaces of 100 and over 200 person capacity, combined with our proximity to the downtown shops, galleries, eateries, nightlife, makes this project an integral part of the expanding fabric of New Bedford's arts and culture scene. So I want to thank you all for coming and celebrating the next big step in the cultural renaissance of New Bedford. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, so I'm gonna ask uh, Al Vitale and Bill Smith to come up and help us hold the ribbon, and we're gonna move this over. And if you, if you stick around, we'll get you all in the, um, in, the, in the background of the shot, if you could.